And it's these two problems that have led dermatologists to privately wonder if these $1,500 a pop PRP sessions that they're selling to their patients are actually what's driving the effect, or if it's actually the... The following is a live presentation from inside of our membership community. Now, twice a week, I will host these live events. They are presentations on topics about hair loss, hair growth, new studies, best treatment practices, picked by our members that I then build a presentation on, present, and then we host a live Q&A after the call. And we've decided to make this specific call for free. So if you're looking for this level of support, community, connection, and you wanna connect personally with me twice a week or more, join our membership community and you can do exactly that. Otherwise, check out the presentation and I hope you enjoy it. In this presentation, we are going to dive into platelet-rich plasma therapy. Is this therapy worth it for hair regrowth? And if it isn't, what can you do instead that will get you as big a hair gains, but at a fraction of the cost? I think you might be surprised at the answers. Now, if you're watching this presentation, you might be a little PRP curious, and you could be wondering, is PRP for me? So the most natural thing to do is to run a Google search, and you might run a search for PRP for hair loss. And if you type this in, you will find some pretty compelling results from Google's Gemini, their AI research summary tool. And you'll see that basically, Gemini says to do it, you should be doing PRP. So you might walk away thinking, okay, I guess this works, but is PRP worth the cost investment? So you refine your Google search. And the next thing you know is you type in, is it worth it, PRP for hair loss? And what do you know? Gemini comes back with incredible results. And on top of that, you see a fortune article, a reputable magazine suggesting that PRP not only decreases hair shedding and stimulates new hair regrowth, but it also increases the thickness of the hair follicle itself. Now you're starting to get sold but you wonder what about before and after photos? So you run another search and bam, you are hit with incredible before and after photos of patients from clinic after clinic after clinic demonstrating hair regrowth from PRP. So then you think, okay, but well, what do esteemed medical schools have to say about PRP? And what do you know? Harvard Health Blog has an incredibly enticing article about platelet-rich plasma for your hair. And it's not just Harvard that's talking about it. It's Hopkins Medical School talking about the benefits of PRP and its ability to stimulate hair growth. Okay, but what about clinical studies? You're a discerning consumer. You don't just want to see evaluations from Google from clinics and from medical schools. You want to know about the peer-reviewed research. And what do you know? Platelet-rich plasma is highly regarded as an effective tool for regrowth in review after review across 28 different studies. PRP treatment for androgenic alopecia is found to be effective. And at this point, you're thinking, okay, what about, uh, scratch that. I'm done with the whatabouts. Where do I sign up for this? Because Google, magazines, dermatology clinics, medical schools, peer-reviewed articles, they all are in alignment. This is an amazing idea for your hair. So you go to your dermatologists and he offers you a deal on PRP. Six sessions, $1,500 each, $9,000 total investment over the next six months. And you think to yourself, who cares? It's only money. You want hair, you're gonna buy it. And now we fast forward six months later, your hair, is, drum roll please, your hair is the same. It's exactly the same. You have mostly indeterminate results. Maybe you have minor regrowth, maybe not. You can't really tell. Nothing seems to be that different from six months prior. You're not happy about the money that you spent, but you're also really confused about how this could have possibly happened. I mean, how could it be that you have alignment across all of these research tools demonstrating that this stuff works, but you can't reconcile that with your own absence of results. This is just really hard to do. And yet it's the same anecdote that we hear over and over and over again from every single person that we've spoken with who has tried PRP for hair loss, hundreds of them. And in this presentation, we are going to explain how this is actually possible. We're going to dive into why doctors, dermatologists, and the internet at large is lying to you about PRP. We're gonna reveal the real data, which is shocking,
And we're also going to talk about alternatives that cost a fraction of the money and yet get you the same exact hair regrowth. And if you're wondering why you should listen to me, my name is Rob English. I'm the founder of perfecthairhealth.com. I am a researcher. I am a consumer advocate. I'm on the editorial board of a dermatology journal called Dermatology and Therapy. And I publish papers as a first author regularly about hair loss disorders. And I am here to advocate for you. I am in your corner and I'm here to expose why I don't think you should ever buy PRP or any autologous therapy for that matter for hair regrowth. So let's get into that first point about why doctors, dermatologists, and the internet are lying to you. What is PRP? Well, PRP is when you take some blood out of your body and then you centrifuge it to separate specific parts. And that centrifuging collects platelets at the edges of the vial. And those platelets contain growth factors and proteins that are associated with hair growth and a doctor will separate those out they'll concentrate them into an injection and then they'll take that injection and inject over and over and over again into your scalp now this is the same exact therapy we were talking about earlier in the presentation it is the one that is supposed to produce incredible hair gains at least according to 28 different clinical studies and meta-analyses with that said in private conversations that i've had with dermatologists they fully admit that they actually don't know if it's the PRP that they inject into your scalp that's regrowing your hair. Why is that? Well, there are actually two problems with PRP. So the first thing is that our scalp is hypervascularized. So what I mean by that is that there is a lot of blood flow going to our scalp to support our hair follicles. And with those blood flow networks comes a lot of blood, nutrient, and oxygen supply. And in that respect, PRP, those platelets that you inject into your scalp skin, they are what's known as hydrophilic. They love water. And not long after they're injected, will they actually permeate back into those blood vessels and they'll escape into the microcirculatory networks and then travel systemically out of the scalp and throughout the body where they'll become rapidly diluted. And this can happen in mere hours or days after an injection. And so that's the first problem with PRP is that they just don't stick around a long time in the scalp. Second problem is that the needle insertion, the act of making the injection itself and then injecting all of these platelets, which causes rupture in the local tissue, that whole process is innately inflammatory. And because of that, that localized inflammation also evokes platelets and growth factors. And yet because the inflammation remains, those platelets and growth factors will actually stay in the scalp for longer. And it's these two problems that have led dermatologists to privately wonder if these $1,500 a pop PRP sessions that they're selling to their patients are actually what's driving the effect or if it's actually the needle insertion itself. So how can we actually test something like this? Well, you can actually do comparative tests for hair regrowth with PRP versus microneedling. Microneedling is the device on the left-hand side of the screen. Microneedle rollers kind of look like medieval torture devices, and basically they're just concentrations of making micro wounds in the epidermis and dermis of the scalp skin. And those wounds will evoke platelets and growth factors that will remain localized to those sites until they heal. And then PRP injections, they go in the epidermis, dermis, sometimes a little bit deeper, and they inject the platelets that you concentrated from your blood earlier. Now, you can compare these two things, and if PRP is better than microneedling, then we'll see it in terms of better hair regrowth outcomes. And we've actually had these studies take place. We covered them in this video. But the first study assessing microneedling versus PRP, what they did was they set it up in a split scalp design and effectively they microneedled one side of the scalp. And then on the other side of the scalp, the investigators injected PRP. A few months later, they measured the results and lo and behold, the PRP side got regrowth, the microneedling side got regrowth, but the microneedling side performed just as well as the PRP. This was a strong indication that PRP, perhaps the benefits weren't coming from the injections of these platelets, which then escape right back into the bloodstream and then travel throughout the body and become diluted. But perhaps it's actually the localized inflammation from the microneedling effort that then keeps the inflammation there for days, if not weeks, until after that whole inflammation resolves. So that was the first study that was a bit of a shock for researchers. The summary being that microneedling is just as good as PRP. 
But some research groups argued that this wasn't a fair study. They said, well, maybe the PRP on one side of the scalp traveled from that one side all the way over to the other side. And perhaps that's why the microneedling group got the same exact results. It was the diffusion of the PRP from one side of the split scalp study design all the way to the other. Fair enough. Researchers then did a different test. In fact, this test happened before that split scalp study. In one group on females with pattern hair loss, women just received saline injections inside of their scalp. So one scalp, saline injections everywhere to mimic PRP, but as a placebo. And then in the other group, they got PRP injections all through the scalp. The summary of that study, PRP does not work any better than saline injections. What this tells us is that the benefits from PRP come not from the injection of platelets, which is what you pay for. That's why it costs $1,500 to centrifuge the platelets, concentrate them, and inject them back into your scalp. The benefits don't come from the platelets itself. It comes from inserting a needle into your scalp, which evokes the same platelets and more localized inflammation that remains for longer than the actual PRP injections. So the takeaway here that I want you to have is that microneedling is just as good as PRP. It hits similar mechanisms. It can be done at home. It also costs just $10. And this is probably true not just with PRP, but with any autologous therapy for hair regrowth. Autologous therapy means derived from your own body. So think therapies like PRP plus A cell, adipose derived stem cells, exosomes, PRF, platelet rich fibrin. These things get offered over and over and over again to consumers who are facing hair loss. I don't see them as any more beneficial as a needle insertion. And yet these things are just dressed up differently, innovated every five years, and then sold as these novel therapeutics for hair growth when we know it's basically just PRP and another marketing scheme. So you might be thinking, well, okay, what about those PRP before and after photos that I saw from clinics? I mean, how can it be that PRP doesn't really produce a massive effect, but then we have photos like this? Well, these clinics, they often will ever only show you PRP clients who are also using medical therapies, finasteride, minoxidil, dutasteride, but they often do not disclose that. I'm not saying that that is happening for this before and after photo. I am saying that that's generally why the before and after photos that you see online look so impressive. But even if they weren't doing this and obfuscating their results, one out of a thousand PRP patients is probably going to get an amazing result just because of the variance in results achievements. So we can't conflate what is possible versus what is probable. And to dive into this more, to understand what the difference is between possible versus probable, look at this chart. These little dots all around constitute a trend. And every one of these dots represents what's possible on this chart. But this trend line right here is what's probable. Possible individual data point probable the average across all time markings and sometimes the difference between possible and probable is huge and that's going to be the case with before and after photos that circulate the internet for prp or any treatment for that matter so we can look at things like this and say wow look at those responses or look at these responses or look at these responses but what's probable is far lower than what you will see popularized advertised to sell you products on the internet what is possible is one person's result what's probable is the expected result and that is why if you navigate to our compare treatments feature platelet-rich plasma therapy doesn't even break above a one the average experience for somebody is not even cosmetic levels of hair regrowth it is microscopic hair gains that you can see on a trico scan device but not in person again on the x-axis for these charts, we have the months that you're using something. On the y-axis, we have the regrowth potential. You have to break above that one for cosmetic levels of hair regrowth. And the way that we set this up is that we actually use trica scan and photo trichogram data to build these charts for hair density changes. But if researchers never corroborate those findings from trica scans that they report as endpoints in their studies with actual before and after photos, or they can't provide a high density of before and after photos with cosmetic regrowth, they don't break above a one. And this is the same exact result that we tend to see with microneedling. These therapies are equal to one another. You should not 
opt for one that costs 100x more. So I hope this presentation helps and I will see you guys next time.